The couple of guys who've been doing this for quite some time. Uh, on my far left is Chetan Povaram. Uh, he is from Coca-Cola and he is their global innovation leader. Come on in, it's okay. Oh, don't come on in, it's fine. Uh, and then uh, to my left, we have uh, an innovator by the name of Greg Adams. Greg, among his many hats, most recently uh, was one of the executive directors of innovation at NCR Corporation. It's awesome to have you guys here. Please have a seat and Thank give you. them a round of applause for being here. Thank you guys. Uh, I'm going to try to project and be real loud, and I'm going to let these guys share the mic, so just know uh, I'm going to be loud. So I'll, I'll just give it to one of you guys. Uh, so guys, experience-led organizations. Help define what that means. Um, we can start with you, Chathan, and, and go to Greg and, and see, uh, see what does it mean for your organization. Yeah, absolutely. Um, nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, so I've been at the Coca-Cola company for five years, and I think we've made a real transition in terms of how we tended to do things before. You know, a large organization, you know, little risk, because the last thing you want is your name all over the paper. Uh, but we really changed that to, be, to do things, um, I'll say start in small chunks and then see how you can actually try and scale that up. So we've done, when you think about experience-led organizations and the fact that you're trying to do things slowly and getting feedback and then scaling. We did something this year called co-creations as an example. And it's small launches, once a quarter, small markets, get feedback before you scale it up. Because if you think about our network and you think about hundreds of bottlers across all the different, uh, you know, globally, trying to scale something up is, is a pretty big task and trying to ensure that the quality and how things scale up. So that's kind of one way in which we've started to think about it is, you know, try something slow, see if it works, and then kind of scale it up based on the experience. And there were some fun products we launched this year, if you go and kind of take a look at it. One was, how, does beverage, how do beverages taste in space, right? So that was one of the things we came up maybe three quarters ago. The one that's currently going on right now is, is, is beverages in dreams. Right, so it's something that a, a, you know, a group of I'm sure marketeers kind of came together and said, what are some of the things that we haven't tapped into yet? And let's see how this is gonna work before we spend all the investment and time and try to scale it up. So. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, again, I'm Greg Adams and uh, I've helped positions, startups, large companies, uh, and all, all across the globe in innovation. And uh, most recently at NCR, I retired from NCR, great company by the way, about a year ago from the innovation team. And NCR called and said, we're a 130 year old company that constantly reinvents ourselves. And we are looking for somebody to come build a team to create a startup culture, a startup team inside a 130 year old company with the whole goal of generating revenue, making that digital transformation. And so one of the things that we focused on was how do we take the sense of urgency that comes with a startup and how do we bring that into a large corporation? And, you know, in a small company, small startup, you look over to Chatham, <laughs> should we do it? Yeah, let's go do it. A uh, large company, it's not that way. It's a company by uh, data-driven decisions, getting consensus, heavy focuses on business case, uh, and quite honestly, one of your biggest tools or levers that you have is customers. So getting the customers on board and letting them help drive momentum and decisions in the company. So that's a little bit of what we did at a high level at NCR. Uh, much like uh, Tatum's themes, we focused on collaboration agreements. So setting up uh, agreements where both companies have skin in the game. So large customers, big banks, we would create an agreement where we would fund so many innovation dollars, they would fund so many innovation dollars, we would have to wrap up IP in the discussion, always a tricky and tough decision or conversation piece. And then we would uh, wrap some governance around those collaboration agreements. So how do we present to the executive teams? Who, who gets to vote yay or nay on these things? And that turned out to be quite a, a powerful tool that we were able to use inside of NCR um, for, for driving innovation. 
And Chetan, you, you casually mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, hey, we're just launching stuff quickly now. Uh, obviously, uh, Coca-Cola also is a hundred plus year old organization. Uh, what was it like to make that, uh, uh, we'll say, tr uh, <laughs> that innovation, right? Going from, you know, maybe just a longer drawn out process to, hey, we can actually launch things quickly. I mean, this wasn't just an overnight thing, right? Uh, no, not at all. And for a company of that size to kind of make the transformation is not easy. So we had this whole thing called Emerging Stronger during COVID. And, and I think a lot of credit goes back to the leadership within the company. I think one of the things they saw was we were spending a lot of dollars trying to come up with the same product in Asia, come up with the same product in Europe, come up with the same product in Latin America. And you felt like, why are we developing six different things when we should really be focusing on one and trying to tweak what we have? And so one of the main things that kind of came out of that is be bold, take risks. It's okay to fail. Like we were actually celebrating failure. That was something that's unheard of in the history of the company. And so there was a big I think a lot of it really went back to the mindset and really what we were seeing as a North Star coming all the way from the leaders of the organization. Like how do we make these things faster? Like let's start small, let's scale it up, let's, let's, let's get something going and then think about how we can make it big. And so that was really I think what drove the organization in order to make things go a lot quicker and a lot faster. And, and to me, it all really started from kind of the North Star that, that our leadership team had. And that really, really changed the culture because we were seeing them not just talk, but also walk the talk in terms of how they were doing it. And there were uh, many projects that people had pet projects all the time, right? It's like, I think this is the next best thing that we're going to have in the market. But all of those things were, were kind of you know, gone at that point because you had, to, you had to be fast. You had to get a cross-functional team to really you know, make sure they were on board before you did anything. And sometimes I think in the past, maybe the bureaucracy of the process, you could kind of get through it in a certain way and still launch a product without maybe necessarily having, you know, uh, agreement across the board. So you mentioned culture and, you know, a lot of the organizations we work with, culture, uh, uh, I hate to use the phrase culture eats strategy for breakfast. I don't believe that fully, right? I believe strategy and culture are really important. But culture is often about reinforcing behaviors or helping people make better behaviors or choices. Could you speak about how do you guys go about doing that? Like, how do you go about influencing culture or building those new behaviors? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people in the audience who are like, man, the culture is stifling my ability to be innovative. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think a big, I think there are two or three big steps, right? One is defining where we want to be. And second is all around communication. And it has to be communicated in a way that people across the organizations, across functions can relate to it and really understand what it means. And I think that's something that I've seen the company do really well in the last two years, you know, starting with what is the big level strategy, but also defining the behaviors. And I think that made a big difference when you kind of define the behaviors. Like everybody's empowered to do things and it's part of some of the pillars that we have saying everybody's empowered to make decisions. Uh, but and and. And I think that was not the case before, right? So if I kind of look at a couple of things that have made the change, it's reinforcing the same thing and talking about examples, like what has worked and what has not worked. We actually launched Topo Chico, uh, which was a product in Latin America. And we took it and, and, and were able to launch it in about eight weeks, maybe 10 weeks, which, you know, which is, I don't know how they did it, but they did it. Right? And I think what really made the difference is having a focus team that worked on just one project and said, this is what you're going to be doing for the next eight weeks. I think as we all know, we all have a lot on our plate and you kind of look at the time you spend between projects. You don't necessarily feel that you're giving it the due time that it's that is required. And I think having a focus like that really helped make the change. Um, so I think a lot of it goes back to leadership set things, but they followed it up with practice right? and actual examples of what worked. That's awesome. Quick, I, I want to hear from you. I just want a quick show of hands. Who feels empowered in their organization today? It's a good bet. <laughs> I hope y'all do. <laughs> That'd be real awkward if they didn't, y'all. We, we'd have to talk offline. There'd be a, a therapy session. I said you're empowered. Uh, all right, Greg. I'd love, to, I'd love to learn more about the cultural side for you. <laughs> so the... The key is, uh, is empowering the people that do the work. And one of the first things we did at NCR, and, 
And NCR, a lot of great processes, stage gate, agile, design thinking, but a lot of that never really reached the threshold or never really delivered on the promise. So one of the things that we did was we sent a team through the Flashpoint program at ATDC. We sent a salesperson, a product manager, an engineer, in fact, one of, one of the engineers is here. And that was an immersive, deep dive program if you've ever been through Flashpoint. But it shows you how to reevaluate the needs of the customer because the customer usually doesn't even know what they want. They just have an innate need, there are impediments to change, and if you've been through the program, you understand that. So we started that to try to get the team's mindset set right. And then some of the tricks and tools that we used internally were we did a lot of prototyping. In fact, I would say prototyping was one of the main things that we did. And prototyping in the dark corner of a lab is useless. You have to prototype, you have to do what I would call road shows. Mm -hmm. You have to get customers engaged. So we had an innovation lab, two innovation labs, in fact, over here at NCR, where we would, uh, once a month, bring in the executive team and we would do demonstrations of techniques, technologies, and we had a section where we bring customers in and do the same thing. And slowly over time, people began to understand that you know, we were a part of the team, we were an early part of the design process, and they would start to come to us and, and learn to trust us. And so building that trust, I think, was important. Uh, I would say another key aspect in a big corporation is we didn't focus on kind of the touchy-feely, isn't that cool. We actually spent a lot of time on business cases. So if you're going to go up the chain and you're going to present an idea to an executive leader, and when I was at IBM, I used to joke that they didn't care if we were stamping garbage can lids. If the business case made sense, it was going to fly through IBM. And so we focused very heavily on business cases and, and rock solid water type business cases. And with those types of techniques, we were slowly able to change the momentum and the culture of the company. Can you both, yeah, please, please. Yeah. yeah, so I think I, you know, just to what Greg was talking about prototypes, I can't say how important that is because I feel like in the digital world today, we have everything on a computer and we show people on a computer. And unless you touch and feel it and actually, you know, get to experience things, it makes such a huge difference. You know, one that I can think of, and um, so I, I, I specifically lead innovation for the McDonald's division. We have a division just exclusively for McDonald's as a customer. And we, we were working on a, on a dispenser for water uh, with that customer. And, you know, it takes a while. You know, we think we're big, sometimes they're bigger, right, just in terms of how to get things done. And we had a convention that McDonald's had set up back in April this year. So we had 15,000 people at the convention, all their owner operators across, across the globe. And we actually had a prototype of the dispenser sitting there. It wasn't working, it wasn't dispensing anything, but all the markets were able to walk through it and all the countries and see it and touch and feel it. And it's gotten to a point where we're, we're, we're hoping to see a lot more demand than we expected. And all that really, really changed was up until then, we had these 3D images that we would show us like, all right, it looks good, but I can't really see it, I can't touch it. But being there, spending time with the customers, walking them through it and saying, this is how it works, these are the things it can do, just made a huge, huge difference for us that we're sometimes nervous, can we really meet the demand if everything goes well? So I just wanted to kind of reiterate that point. Yeah, I, I, th I think that's a key point is the customer. We, we did a thing we called Area 51 in NCR. We, we had a room roughly the size of this room and at different trade shows we would set it up and we would staff it. And it was by invitation only. It was this dark, super secret, you know, thing of the future. But you'd walk in and there would be a, a bank branch. There would be a retail uh, setting. And we would walk through, just like, like you did, walk through our thoughts and ideas of the future um, and a guided tour with the customers. And those types of events where you're prototyping and showing the customers, where you're taking them through your vision for the future, those are the things that customers love. And if the customers love it, then the sales teams get on board. And once you have the sales teams on board and you get the customers on board, you can pretty much steamroll a pretty big path through a corporation. 
Uh, but I think that's the key. You had, you had a key. So uh, I guess what I heard, one, was prototyping's big. Uh, two, uh, getting the sales team to get bought into what you're doing is probably one of the easiest paths forward. And you weren't all that innovative to do it. You just worked with the sales team and made sure, like, hey, listen, I just need to get your buy-in, and I'll have the promoting pressure I need. Could you speak to uh, how do you help your teams figure out how to do that work, right? Because a lot of other practitioners, I'm a researcher, I'm a strategist, I'm a designer. They're familiar with their craft, but you guys are often talking about culture and politics and, and sort of psychological pressures. How do you teach your teams how to behave that way? Well, I think first off, you have to find the right people. So we look for people who uh, just do it. You know, I mentor a lot of young entrepreneurs and my, if I give them one piece of advice, it's just go do it. Don't ask for permission, uh, just go do it. And so you have to have that mindset in the team to go do it. With the customers, every customer wants to do an innovation project. Okay, every customer comes in. We want to, we want to work with you, we want to do an innovation project. So you, you have to set some types of metrics for what, where that line is to work with a customer. And you can set it in terms of return on investment, you can set it in terms of revenue, but there has to be a line. And if you're very honest with the customer and say, you know, that's interesting, but that doesn't cross the threshold, they, they appreciate that. So, but it does take some tough discussion. Yeah, go ahead. You, you may, yes. <laughs> um, I was curious, you know, you talk about taking customers to the innovation space and working with sales. How do you balance the delicate line of selling a vision and the reality of today? Yeah, so I think that is one of the biggest mistakes that companies make. So I'll go back to my times at Internet Security Systems. I'm going to date myself. Very few companies want to show a three-year, four-year, five-year roadmap. Oh, we can't show that. They may, you know, they may actually want that or we're giving away the secrets. <laughs> But the reality of it is that's the best tool you could ever have to work with customers because you can cast your vision there. You have time to adjust your vision. You can get their feedback. Um, and, and my background was product management and engineering. And so I think you have to have the confidence to be able to, to, to put forward your thoughts in your roadmap because if you're a true leader in your space, they're looking for you to lay out your vision and your roadmap. If you're not a true leader, sit back and do the six month roadmap. But it takes a, you have to be a little bit brave and you have to lay it out there. I've kind of going back to the yeah, question that yeah. you had, I think curiosity is a big aspect. Um, I'm an engineer by trade and one of the things I've noticed with engineers is you kind of get handed a document and said this is what the customer wants, go build it. Yeah. Right? So you kind of sit behind a computer, you sit in a conference room and you try and work it out. But I've had people on the team, the first thing I'm like, go, go spend a day at a customer or go spend a day at a McDonald's sitting and seeing how customers interact with different things. Like when do they smile, when do they not smile, what makes them happy, what doesn't make them happy. And I think that eight hours of sitting there and actually watching things happen is just invaluable. And so it's, it's how do you bring you know, those kind of people who are not just looking at those aspects, but what else is happening across industries? Because I think gone are the points, you know, days where it's like, okay, I'm gonna work in the aerospace, I'm gonna work in F&B. Everything has changed these days. Like you can take techniques from one and put it in the other. And those are the, the kind of people I would love to have on my team any day. Like being curious, being challenging to what we're doing and you know, this company is doing it this way, why can't we see and learn and, and make those kinds of things happen? So we're, we're starting to do a little bit more of that where we're all um, empowered to, um, to look outside, you know, talk to various organizations. And you know, one thing when I started with this team and they said market visits, I'm like, okay, this seems fun. And you know, they would pick fun places out of the country to do market visits. I'm like, okay, we're gonna spend three days for a market visit, like going out on restaurants. All right, I'll go. But you know, just being there and tasting things and looking at things, like I learned so much. And just talking to customers, talking to consumers too sometimes. And, and you can get a lot from just you know, being there and seeing things. And um, sometimes I think companies shy away from doing that saying, I, I can't see the value in you know, sending somebody for a $5,000 trip somewhere, but it's invaluable. Just the experience that, that people get by being there 
touching things, feeling things, and seeing things. Yes, I was going to build on that. So it sounds like in a lot of the cases, in, in both of y'all's experience, uh, having a lab, having prototypes, having things that are real in order to immerse people into that experience seems transformational. Are there any other behaviors that you feel like are necessary when it comes to making better data-driven decisions, particularly in an organization where uh, maybe people were just going by their gut? I think, Greg, you mentioned, yeah, a lot of people just say, like, I think that's the thing, let's go do it. Meanwhile, we're talking about a lot of customer-led innovation and there's data that's coming from it. How do you, how do you see the behaviors and, or maybe even help the behaviors change in a much more data-driven dialogue? Yeah, I mean, uh, a good example, you know, we as a company are known for doing a lot of consumer surveys and getting a lot of information back. And if you kind of look at the trends of health and everything else in the last five, 10 years, people have been heavily focused on healthy beverages, natural beverages, you know, those types of things, you know, low sugar, right? We as a company five years ago could have said, you know, let's forget all of that and we're still going to do what we're going to do. But I think we have kind of embraced that really at this point saying, the Gen Zs, what do the Gen Zs want? Because they're a big portion of our current and future, you know, consumers and customers, right? So all of that is based on data, right? And I think gone are the days, like I was saying before, it's like, oh, I think this is something that's gonna work, but let's go get consumer data. So it's kind of now built into the way people think. Like sometimes you can put it as part of a process, but it gets too bureaucratic sometimes. And unless it becomes part of the way people think and do things on a day-to-day -day perspective, it's hard to make the change. Like I have many examples on what we do today for our customer where before we used to not go in with data and we said, this doesn't work, that doesn't work. And we just kind of get these blank stares. It's like, I don't know what you're talking about. So we've made a, a definite change. I want to say in the last 18 months that everything we're doing these days is based on let's go collect some information. Even if it's 10 stores, even if it's five stores, even if it's a small data set, let's go and figure out is the quality of our beverage at this store tasting the way it's supposed to. And if not, let's figure out why and let's have a discussion. Um, and that's really, really changed things because we're starting to see the same thing from the other side too. It's like, okay, I, I get now why you're concerned about something, right? So a lot of it is by just by doing it as part of kind of day to day. And when two or three people start doing it and they kind of see the traction, everybody kind of follows with it. Yeah, I, I can't stress that enough. You know, the, the concept of innovation being, you know, the flip the switch and the light comes on and it's aha, that's a, if that's your concept of innovation, that's incorrect. Innovation is just hard work. It's an idea applied to an opportunity. And we try to focus very heavily on gathering the data to make a business case decision. And that, that data is market data, it's what your customer base like, uh, pricing, you name it, we put that in the business case. And you have to make, the, at the end of the day, data for the sake of data is worthless. Data has to be put into some consumable, usable format. I don't care whether you're talking predictive analytics, some machine learning, or business case. It has to be put in a format that people can consume and use. In the large corporations, right, wrong, or different, that is a business case. So that's the way we would try to steer the, the data and the usage of the data. So before we got on stage, I had a great conversation with someone in the audience, and they were asking me some questions around how DE&I plays a role in innovation. So we're talking about making data decisions, excuse me, uh, data-driven decisions, and gathering the data is as important as those who interpret the data. Right? And we live in a global society now. Uh, my experience here in Georgia, uh, just in Florida, could be very different, let alone halfway around the world. Uh, I'm curious how DE&I has played a role in how you guys either build teams or try to teach people how to interpret data, because obviously the way I do it, you do it, and you do it, based on our lived experiences, could be vastly different. Yeah. Well, I'll give a short example. When, one of the companies I was involved with, Predicto, the whole premise was that bias in data slants the results that are generated from AI, machine learning, et cetera. So we purposefully built tools that would remove the human element of bias from the data. So a data scientist may say, you know, I think uh, uh, average time in flight is an important feature to generate. But 
if you look at the data objectively or with a machine, it, it may not be important at all. So one of the things we tried to focus on, especially in the analytics space, is to remove the human decision-making process from that as much as possible. Um, whether it was picking the algorithms, picking the features, the more you can automate that, the less likely you are to introduce bias and error and maybe find the right answer. I think in addition to what Greg said, from a DE&I perspective, I think for us it's gonna change the way we hire people, all right? So data is one aspect, but we talk a lot about DE&I during all the conversations, right? And it's a, it's a kind of an old traditional company, so DE&I becomes really important. So for us, it's been like, how do we hire people? What is the nature of the teams? What is the breakup of the teams? And we're always looking at metrics around DE&I. And I think people need to be careful, organizations need to be careful for checking the box, just to check the box and saying, okay, I got a 60% number and that's what I started and that's what my bonus is based on. But it really needs to be based on the right decisions. And if you're not at 60% for whatever and it's 50% and it's for the right reasons, it's okay. So that's, that's how DE&I has played an effect for us. That's awesome. So one other question I have, and I want to open it up to the audience. Uh, I'd love to hear about some failures that you're proud of uh, and, and failures that perhaps uh, even shaped in a positive way the outcome of your organization. In other words, hey, I failed at this, but we learned something along the way, and executives or other stakeholders found value in that. Um, obviously, as people who are maybe new or even you know, kind of mid-level in their career in innovation, regardless of, of being an experienced professional, that can feel a little scary, right? And so I've learned to celebrate my failures. It happens every day. It might be happening right now. But I'm curious how you guys, uh, don't tell me. I'm curious how you guys uh, deal with that, right? And, and maybe there's some stories you could share that would enlighten, uh, enlighten them. Yeah, yeah sure. So about uh, two years ago, we looked at the portfolio of products we have and we had 400 different products. And then as you kind of you know, put that on a sheet of paper, 200 of those products were responsible for 2% of the revenue, right? So how many of you have had tab here before? All right, it doesn't exist anymore, right? So, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the same thing with Zico, which is a coconut water brand, uh, Coke Energy, right? So there are a lot of products that were being launched because it's like, oh, we got to innovate, we got to innovate, and let's kind of launch these things. And so the, the, really the leadership said, we need to go from 400 down to 200. And so it was, just, it was half the portfolio. And all of that happened really quick. I think once you kind of showed the numbers and, and people understood, I mean, we're spending all of this money and this is maybe 0.2% of our revenue. Like, why do we even want to have this as a brand? I'd rather take those resources and, and put it on something which actually can make a difference. Um, so, and we've talked about that openly. And the only way we can get that through to the organization is, is the leadership being able to talk about it and saying, we're gonna cut Zico, we're gonna cut uh, Tab. And there was a lot of uh, sentiments around it because people love Tab. So there was a lot of you know, social media comments about why the company was going down the path, but it just kind of made sense when you kind of look at the numbers at the end of the day. So I think, Taking risk and celebrating risk and celebrating failures is important. And uh, Mr. Quincy, our CEO, talks about that openly in um, a lot of columns and other things where we say, we try to launch this, it didn't work, this is what we learned from it. How do we kind of take that and use that learning for the next development that we have? So I think just open communication is important. Um, nobody has to hide in the closet saying, oh, or, you know, we're saying, okay, we failed, we didn't. This person's gonna, you know, have to be, uh, you know, not, not be in a good situation for that, but we say, what do we learn? How do we move forward and, and go forward with it? Yeah, I, I think failure is just part of the process. And it goes back to your earlier question about culture. And I know when we talked earlier, failure is part of the culture. It's acceptable and it's just understood. Um, you know, I've had so many failures. Um, way more failures than successes. But I'll, I'll pick an old, old example. I was with a company called Internet Security Systems. And we were, we were bought by IBM for $1.4 billion, was a great day. Uh, and they were a leader in the cybersecurity space. We had a, an aging product called Internet Scanner. It was the founding product of the company. And it was getting long in the tooth and we wanted to reinvent the way that vulnerability assessment was done uh, in, in corporations. 
So we came up with a concept. We had a research team called X-Force. We sat down with the X-Force, came up with this concept we called Enterprise Scanner. And it was, it was going to move us toward cloud-based, uh, new architecture, better pricing models, et cetera. And, and we discussed to what degree do we reinvent that space, that product, that technology. And we swing hard to kind of go for the fences. And so we went for the fences with that product. And the technological challenges that we ran into trying to actually productize it, we prototyped it, we tested it with customers, everything looked great. But we failed to really grasp the very subtle and core underlying technology challenges that there were that were inherent in that type of product. We eventually got it out, but we missed a key market window. And um, so in my view, that was a failure, and it was really a failure to do due diligence and homework at a low technolo technology level. I have a quick question. So <clears throat> to that point, missing that market window, um, who much of that any was to do with the product itself? Like the company rather than the challenge? Yeah, it's um, companies get inertia, right? And they they get reliant on that steady revenue flow. And so, okay, if we're, we'll grow five percent this year. So, to some degree, you have to present a business case or a picture that changes that paradigm. And Hitting these market windows, I, I think sometimes it's hard to see it from within the company. I use people like Gartner. Um, I use customers. Another bellwether that I often used was the very, very early stage startups, the ones that you probably wouldn't pay attention to. But you can be too early. I've been too early with products, and of course we've all been too late with products. But, but I, I think pulling yourself out of your company's cocoon, talking to analysts, paying attention to the very small startup uh, community, I would say customers, but customers really don't have that far of, it, of a vision. But th that would be my advice. I don't think there's a silver bullet, but that's what's worked for me in the past. Other questions? You covered it. Uh, yes, ma'am, in the back. Um, I have a question for you. Sure. I'm curious, you talked about how Coca-Cola's portfolio has reduced, and that was a very deliberate move on your part. But at the same time, you're continuing to acquire new brands. So like, how do you think about the two arms that, one, I know some of the reduction is also driven by supply chain issues, and the fact that you don't want to maintain such a big portfolio. How do you think about that? No, it's a, it's a good question, and that really goes back to our strategy uh, from three years ago where we came up with beverages for life, and that really meant there's the soda part, but there is also the other part, and that was all driven by consumer insight, where people are looking for kombucha and you know those types of beverages. So our acquisition was very strategic, really looking at filling those holes where we didn't have product or we were looking to grow in a certain market, uh, like Powerade was one of those that we acquired a couple of years ago because the energy market was growing, right? There was Red Bull and we felt we were not playing in that space. So those, anything that has been acquired is really to fill some of those gaps that we felt was, as we were seeing consumer trends, we were growing, but we were not playing in that space. So that's kind of how we balance those two in terms of which areas do we go and acquire companies and which areas or portfolios that we already have that we need to divest. I think I saw a hand over here and then over here. John, back to the HR question related to embracing failure. Obviously, every product out there has a team of people whose livelihood depends on that product at the company. And if you're going to make some kind of a change, if they're doing their job well, they're going to be doing everything they can to keep that product in the flow because their livelihood is dependent on it. So when you talk about embracing change or failure, um, it seems like that team has to be a part of that conversation. Again, kind of back to that question about when you're trying to create a culture to accept those kinds of changes, those people come into the conversation. Right. When you're saying specific policies or cultural decisions that you guys have made related to that. 
Yeah, I, I think it's a very much a case by case basis. And so what we've done, and we've actually, we've actually done this in practice, where if we've had those kind of situations, we've been able to move those people, if they have the right skill set, to other parts of the business. Right, so where there is a need for something, or this person has so much experience in something else. And by being able to do that, and other people seeing that, okay, just because this thing did not work, you know, that they had to be let go or something was not the case. And we've had many such examples, even within our own division, where a certain product, a certain, you know, certain whatever we were trying to launch did not work the way it was going. But we took all of those resources and deployed them in other parts of the business. So I think a lot of it really goes back by practice and by, by showing people that if not here, there's always another place that people can go to. And I think kind of setting that example made, it made a huge difference. Josh, I think you had a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, and John, to really follow up on your question, flip that around. From your experience, not now as leaders, but the way back machine 10, 15 years, as an individual contributor in an organization or um, we're coming into an organization and you realize that this is a piece that, that may be a blind spot to leadership, what advice would you have for somebody who's innovative at heart like the two of you through your careers, you know, to have a positive impact on that organization to the point where leadership sees the value of it? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll point to uh, a living example, uh, Matt Burris right here on the NCR team. The coaching that I would give to my younger self would be just do it. If you see something that needs to be done, do it. Nobody ever got fired for doing something, over delivering, working on you know, the next greatest project, and then share that. That's the key to being successful in a corporation is don't wait back. Don't sit back, wait for somebody to tell you what to do. You just go do it. And if you have that attitude and you ex execute upon that, um, you'll, you'll never run into a corporation where somebody doesn't want to hear about ideas. And you just got to get over that shyness, that reluctance, and, and just lay yourself out there. I don't, don't know any other, any other way to describe it. Um, I wish I had Greg as a mentor when I was uh, you know, starting my career. <laughs> but, but honestly, I, I think many times we're all in the position, right? Um, still young in the careers, you kind of sit back, wait to be told what to do. But, you know, like you said, just go do it. If, if you have the right mindset, if you're trying to do the right thing, people see it and you actually have more people supporting you than not. Um, it, it just takes a little bit to be able to get there. But I, I feel like that is more embraced these days, maybe than, you know, 15, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. because there was a certain way of doing things. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I can't yeah. agree with you more. Uh, Courtly. Question about funding in a large organization. <laughs> the traditional method to come up with is fiction writing exercise, a business case, and then get it. It's creative writing. <laughs> did you uh, did, did you change that at Coca Cola and NCR? Are there differences in the way your teams or your projects are are supported? So yeah, we still we still very much have those things, but I think we've we've changed the way where it's more brand specific. So we have brand teams that are really looking at how they want to kind of drive the product, and we've kind of really changed it to some of the core brands, and also as part of that is some of our emerging portfolio in terms of how we want to do things. But I think to answer your question, I, I feel like there always needs to be some amount of money that's set aside as risk. Yeah. Like unless you set that aside and say. This 50K, if I don't get anything out of it, it's okay. I learned something from that. And a great example that I have was at the end of last year, we, we had some funding that was available and we said, okay, what are these shovel ready projects that we want to do? And so there was one that we thought was, it uses AI and ML and we're like, okay, is this something that's really gonna fly? We found a great partner and we said, okay, let's try to deploy this and see what we're gonna get from it. And even the partner said, I think there's a 10% probability that this is going to work, but let's see what we can do. We actually were, we were actually at 95% success when we got to this year, right? And we never thought that was something that was going to work. And they were so stoked that they said, we're ready to co-fund some of this moving forward. And uh, we want you to come and, and talk about the success on they have an annual, you know, big, big, big event that they do globally. Like they never thought this was something that was going to work. And we said we had very little probability it was. But that has 
people have been with the organization for 30 years and kind of seeing them, it's like, huh, I never thought that was something like we would even be in. Because kind of, you talk beverages and AI and ML and cameras and detection and all of that. Um, and, and, and people are really excited now where we're looking at how we can move forward with it and, and show our customer that there's value in some of these things. Yeah. Uh, let me add on. The fact of the matter is, the innovation teams are overhead, okay? And so at the end of the end of the year when you're looking at budget, they could be on the chopping block. Some techniques that I have seen to help prevent that are forming alliances with customers. So I talked about something earlier called a collaboration agreement. If you can get buy-in from a customer to work on innovation with you, work on concepts or ideas, then that returns in terms of increased sales volume. And so if you're able to do those types of arrangements with customers, and customers love that, by the way, sales loves that, and you can show return, then at the end of the day when the budget comes, there may be some discussion about cutting your budget, but you're probably not first in line. All right, we got time for one last question. I'm just curious, how do you keep yourself grounded and motivated in, in moving forward? think about culture, when you think about all the moving pieces, you know, you're human as well. So what are some practices or principles do you have um, for yourself? I think the biggest is to be open to change, right? The minute you, you, you kind of say, I'm, I'm not, that's when everything around you, I feel like it, it really changes. And I, and I have to say, the last couple of years, I come in every morning excited um, just because it's a different day every day. There's new challenges and there's new way of thinking. Um, there's, there's always excitement and, and I feel kind of being part of a customer team makes a big difference. Uh, just, just for me, the way I think and do things and, it's, and I think it's to find that passion point, right? In, in the sense of what is it that moves you? What is it that, that makes you go in the morning? And even without your coffee, you know, being bright, wide awake in the morning. And it's to just figure that out and see what's the best company, best position, the best organization to be part of. Um, so to me, I, I think early on, one of the things that I learned is always be open to change. Like there's, you know, every two years there's a new thing that comes up and he says, we're going to do things this way. And you kind of peel the onion, 80% is still the same thing, right? 20% changes, there's a little bit of dressing that kind of changes. But at the end of the day, I think a huge difference is um, just be open to change and, and be curious and learn new things. And when I kind of go in with that mindset, it's really helped me and saying, how do we make these things better? I know we've done things in a certain way, but uh, there's a different way to do it, and let's explore it. Yeah, I, I would say this is something I've learned over the years. You know, when I was young engineer, I was full of myself, cocky, et cetera. But uh, time and experience has a way of changing that perspective. So, you know, for me, it's about loving what I do, enjoying the work, and and now it's all about the people. I mean, when I, when I would come in in the morning and look around, I just think, you know, I'm just a poor boy from Kentucky. I work with some of the smartest people in the world, and it's just a blessing that the Lord's given me to work with these people. And so that's a view I take. I try to put myself in their shoes to the degree that I can, understand their view. But for me, it's about the blessing of people that come across your uh, Come across your path. It's awesome. All right, well, please give a big round of applause to Chaitlin Drive.